The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond Sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. All right. Okay, uh, here's the uh, uh, agenda. Uh, we'll first talk a little bit about um, NoSQL. What's the difference between NoSQL and MySQL and the relational database? So why uh, NoSQL is kind of a, a hot uh, topic right now. And um, we also talk about some another solution that uh, we are currently a lot of uh, uh, web company is dealing with this NoSQL. Uh, they use MySQL plus uh, some front, front end uh, um, such as Memcached. Then we talk a little about the problem with those two solutions. So what's anything that the particular that uh, we can uh, explore? Uh, so then I bring out our solution, which is um, Memcached plus NoDB. Or eventually, this MemCached can extend to any uh, NoSQL database. So it's the best of the both worlds. It sol solves uh, problems. Um, then I will talk a little bit how we're going to use the uh, NoDB MemCached. And also, I will go through a MemCached with MySQL cluster, which is different from MySQL. OK, so let's start with uh, a NoSQL. So NoSQL is becoming um, uh, a hot topic uh, recently uh, in the past two years, um, uh, mainly for the a key value store for the, uh, a lot of internet company. So last year, uh, probably two years ago, I started to hear about NoSQL, and it's gaining a momentum. So the reason is being that uh, there's a lot of social network um, a uh, company shows up, they are dealing with a lot of um, uh, simple data uh, or text data. So what they need to do is really not to do uh, any kind of relational uh, uh, explore of the data, rather than they just want uh, the data fast. So it's like uh, you have a friend, and you like these friends, and you make some comments, and you just want those information right away. Um, there's not much uh, very complex relationship uh, those are users and users' friends and those kind of comments. Um, it's very simple. So the relation model, uh, the relationship between those uh, items are not that important. So then it outperforms. So the NoSQL database currently can outperform RDBMS, mainly because they are simple, just simple. They are just um, designed to handle such kind of text queries. Uh, they are designed to handle this fast and with uh, less overhead. So overhead mainly comes from the uh, um, IDBM's uh, query processing and the optimizer. So let's take a look at what the, uh, a relational database will do to process a query. So it's a whole list of the uh, uh, agenda it needs to do. So first, it needs to accept the uh, query of the network. Then it starts to parsing. Okay, so we have support a lot of complex queries, so you, you have to go through the parsing part. Then optimizer generate a plan. Then the query processing going to process the plan. So then it enters to the uh, storage engine. Then it gets to the data. Then for the data, because we support all kinds of transactional uh, um, queries, so we have to lock the table. Then use index from the row. Then start to either lock the rows as well. Then extract the column. Then package it, return to the query processing layer. Then query processing layer decides whether it needs to do a further action, whether it needs to be ordered by or needed to sort them. Then unlock the table, close the table, then return the result. So that's a whole lot of things needed to be for each query. 
So even if you want to just uh, say select uh, from user table uh, where a name ID is 10, and it goes through all those processes. So when we do um, O profiling, okay, we just do a profiling, look at the, uh, what that it does. So on the top, you can see the parser, you can see the optimizer, it's on all the top. And you also do a lot of mem copy uh, between the uh, storage layer uh, to the query processing layer. So that's all costing time. And you don't see any of those InnoDB uh, kind of function here. It's all uh, on the top list. It's all in the MySQL query processing layer, optimizer layer. So it's in the upper layer. Um, the lower level, it's um, fairly negligible. Okay, so for NoSQL database, um, because they are simple, uh, their commands are simple, they just found the key, maybe it's a hash table, or what, they, they then just retrieve the va uh, value right away. They don't need to copy between a storage layer and a query processing layer. They don't need to generate a plan. They just retrieve the value. Also, they have very uh, simple command. So, uh, for example, we do a select um, just for getting a user ID or typing select, star, or whatever from the user table where ID is 10. So that's a very long string. So those strings pass us through the network. Uh, it's quite a bit of overhead. And for the um, uh, NoSQL, uh, such as memcached, we just say get um, 10. So that, that's as simple as that. So there's no not much overhead in terms of the uh, query string itself. Uh, because a lot of things happening over the network, so those are also uh, not uh, uh, negligible uh, right now. So even a short command gives you an edge uh, for those kind of query. So again, there's no um, overhead on the optimizer and the query, so we just talk about that. So currently, there are a bunch of those NoSQL database. Um, MongoDB is gaining a lot of momentum. Uh, Facebook, um, Twitter, all those have MongoDB installations. OK, so there's a lot of also a lot of company that uh, um, mainly rely on MySQL. Um, they provide alternative solution. So the solution is uh, build a uh, memcached uh, on top of the MySQL. So memcached itself um, is a in-memory key value store. So most of the things is hashed in memory. It has a hash table on the key. So it was developed by Danga Interactive for its uh, uh, livejournal.com. So then it gets popular. So it's one of the most widely used in-memory cache implementation for social networks. So almost uh, all those internet company has such kind of uh, setup for memcached. So we will see a little bit later, memcached has very simple and open protocol, a very simple uh, commands uh, to get the results. So this is uh, the existing setup. Most of them uh, talk to uh, MySQL with complex query. Once it gets the result, it just caches them in the memcached. So the next time the query comes in, um, it goes to memcached and fetch directly. So for example, the, um, the user ID part. Uh, so once it gets uh, the, from the database, so like a uh, name from the user table where ID equal to 10, then after it gets the name as a Peter, then it will set um, set a, a key uh, the key value is 10, then the name Peter, so to memcached. So next time I want to get this name, I just get 10. That's the command. So we'll get from memcached right away. Country memcached is all in memory, so it's a hash table. So it hash the value goes there and fetch the data. So we talk, uh, uh, then we, there are problems with those kind of setup. 
even with NoSQL. So for the setup, we just talk about MySQL and Memcached. Basically, you have to keep two data in sync. So Memcached provides you some kind of expiration uh, time. Um, so you can say, um, I have this data expire in 10 seconds. So if I change on the disk, on the relational table, or particularly this uh, key value, then um, the memcached had to read again from the, um, from the uh, uh, database. It needs to be reset. So is there will be difference between the memcached data and in the on-disk uh, table. Um, you need to refresh it every once in a while so that uh, keep them in sync. The other way is that every time you update on the, on the database, you have to update in the memcached. So that's two updates. So you have to update both. So that, that's something that you need to keep them in sync. Also, memcached is not transactional. Uh, it cannot roll back. If you put something wrong there, it will be there. Uh, so you cannot just roll back. It's not like uh, MySQL is transactional. So keep them in sync is a problem, because MySQL can roll back things. Memcached, you can't. So you have to specifically build some mechanism in the uh, uh, web service saying, well, um, I, if I this operation uh, roll back, I need to collect them in the uh, memcached. So the problem with uh, NoSQL, NoSQL is not transactional. It doesn't have transaction uh, properties. So it's not crash uh, safe. So sometimes it crashes. You don't have a copy of it. You then lost it. So a lot of those uh, designs are distributed. So they have multiple nodes, uh, maybe keep uh, the same data. So just to for safe, if it crash on one node, there's a copy on the other node. So if you want to track your email on those uh, NoSQL database, then you, you might sometimes, as there's system crash, you lost the email. But they deal with this with uh, duplication. So you have clusters. So that uh, in case this one node uh, crashed, there's another copy somewhere. But in short, it doesn't guarantee you, right? It's not like a bank um, bank transaction. If you put twenty dollars in, it says it must be in. It doesn't have that. If something crash, you might you may lost your email, you may lost your your information. So that's one big problem. So also, it lacks the uh, asset property, which is a basic uh, property for, uh, for relational database. So they are doing something now moving a little bit toward a relational database as well. They are providing logging. They are providing replication. So this uh, kind of converge into some middle ground between the uh, uh, NoSQL and uh, relational database. So they still want to make sure the data is there. Um, user, it's used from the user uh, experience uh, point of view. So um, for us, we see this kind of um, uh, trend. And we think we want to provide uh, some best of the both world. That's something that uh, a relational database can do. Uh, for the text, uh, for the data handling, we can do that as well. So the idea is that we have a front end of uh, a new SQL uh, products. So it speaks uh, no SQL protocol, uh, simple and easy. And it goes around our uh, optimizer and query process and directly dive into the storage part. So it fetched the data right away because those are simple queries. So we don't need to pass them. Uh, we know what that is. Um, for example, memcached probably have 10 commands. We don't have, it doesn't have any complex uh, uh, query to pass. So we just know what that is. So it goes to storage engine right away. Then we provide all the best for the relational database. We support the uh, asset. We uh, have the uh, index on the key columns for fast access. We have replication. We have recovery, crash safe. And in the meantime, it's dual, dual accessible. 
So you can access the same set of data from SQL. Or you can al also access from the memcached. So this is a, a new feature that uh, we're going to available in uh, MySQL 5.6. So this is a graph showing you that um, what it looks like. So you have an application on top of it. You can access it either through the SQL um, or from the memcached. And the end point, the lower point, is the InnoDB storage engine. And we build a wrap on our functions called the InnoDB APIs. Uh, it used to be uh, embedded InnoDB. I'm not sure people knows embedded InnoDB. It's a kind of a wrap on our storage engine. Um, doesn't have query processing, doesn't have those <coughs> optimized part. But, so that's a set of API uh, built around our InnoDB. Then on top of that, we have the memcached plugin. And the InnoDB memcache is working as an engine for that particular uh, memcached plugin. So we make a memcache itself a plugin for MySQL. So this memcached can be anything. Yeah, go ahead. You can install that plugin just like an InnoDB plugin. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, uh, so, so you maybe say that again. Uh, the, you say how, how to enable this plugin? Uh, that's the question. Okay. So it's, it's like a, a InnoDB MySQL has uh, this uh, uh, kind of um, command say, well, install a particular plugin. So even InnoDB was a plugin itself to the MySQL. So MySQL support multiple engines. It used to be like a storage engines. My ISAM, um, we have this InnoDB. Those are our plugins to, uh, to MySQL. So the command I will show you later in the how to use section, and just say install plugin, uh, the, the, this particular memcached library name. So uh, this memcached plugin can be anything, and we can have different uh, NoSQL database from the end uh, speak a different protocol. So this is just an example of how, uh, using InnoDB APIs to directly dive into storage engine and go around, go bypass this uh, MySQL server. OK, so this is a little bit more detail. Um, so it shows that um, the lib name, the memcached, um, we call the lib memcached.so. It's a shared library. And memcached provides you um, also the mechanism to have a different engine, because memcached itself works, it has an in-memory storage engine. So it has a storage engine, but it provides you a different way to install different engines. So that's, that's uh, a bridge between InnoDB and memcached called the InnoDB memcached engine. So there's two, two actions we did here. First thing is memcached, we made it a plugin of MySQL. So it can run as a separate thread. We installed it, it runs in the, as a, as a, in the background, a separate thread. And then we make InnoDB memcached to uh, an engine of memcached. Then it starts to access the InnoDB. So there are two shared library here. Uh, you don't need to worry about the InnoDB engine. Uh, so that one is installed automatically when you install the uh, lib memcached.so. Okay, so that's, that's the command uh, you were asking. How, how are we going to install that? So the, the command is saying install plugin daemon memcached so name lib memcached.so. So the last one is the shared library we built. Um, so if you download our, um, download our um, production, whatever the package uh, in the plugin uh, directory, you will see this lib memcached.so. So just put in uh, the plugin uh, directory, then just issue this command. 
Of, of course, before that, you need to config uh, the table with some, uh, some information in InnoDB memcached system tables. So then you can start to use the memcached. Is memcached directly boots up? You lesson, it lessens on this uh, port 11211 is by default. Then you can start to uh, store things and get things. OK, so uh, before that, uh, you need to configure the uh, memcached to tell us uh, what's the mapping. So how this our memcached maps to watch an ODB table. So there are three um, tables in a database called InnoDB underscore memcache. Yeah. Uh, is this all on a single service, single port? Yes, yes, yes. So you ask whether it's all on a single user, a server port? Yeah. So, so the magic here, um, we need to tell uh, the memcached um, to exactly what table it maps to. So there are three necessary tables. Uh, we create a, a, there's a script um, in the script session called uh, InnoDB memcached underscore config dot SQL. So you have the code package and you go to the scripts uh, directory. There's a, a, SQL, a SQL file there. Just, just run this SQL file. It will automatically create a database called InnoDB memcache. Then it will create three tables. Um, the first table called containers. Uh, the name is um, uh, we give this name, actually this name comes from uh, NDB and memcached. So we want to keep everything the same. So this will be another set, uh, support for the uh, NDB is the MySQL cluster. So also memcached is supported in MySQL cluster. So we keep everything in sync, and always have the same name. So the containers table basically tells you uh, which uh, most important table that memcached uh, um, commands or goes into. So first uh, you give him a name, then tells this table schema. Uh oh. <coughs> Sorry, uh, my uh, computer crashed for some reason. No, the computer crashed. So maybe overheat or whatever. So anyway, um, any questions so far? <laughs> let's, let's start with questions. You run, you run Windows, right? Yeah, well, I present on Windows, but, but oh, most okay, of the time, okay. yeah, yeah, most of the time we, we do on Linux. <laughs> so, so, yeah. Okay, yeah, it is Windows run, running right now. Yeah, go ahead. Huh? Uh, well, I, I, well uh, yeah, we are making slides on using Windows. So, okay. that's, that's the only thing it, 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 it's good at. Yeah, yeah, it shows why Windows sucks, right? So, okay, yeah. Right. You have a question? These are just an open source plugin, is that true? Yeah, it is. Oh, is this open source uh, uh, plugin? Uh, yes, it is open open source plugin. So you can look at the code, uh, how we implement this, and, um, and uh, it's all open source, yes. Okay, any other questions while waiting this, yeah? Well, no SQLs or any type of values, but any kind of object that's serializable or with a little more text, what, what can you store as a value? Uh, you can store any, uh, well, basically text value. So you have a, a character, char, varchar, blob, those kind of value. So you can uh, store integer or those kind. You have to convert it before you store it. If there is need, uh, we, we, can, we can certainly support the other type. But certainly right now, it's a, a child of child things. Yeah? So if I wanted to use it as PHP, and I wanted to specify multiple memcache servers, I would create like a MySQL replicas. 
Uh huh. Uh, currently, well, you cannot have multiple memcache uh, using me multiple memcache uh, mem memcache Ds. Yeah, I guess that's what I'm saying. Uh huh. Yes. Yes. The thought is that you can kind of have a couple of different memcache. Yes. Yes. When you configure it as PHP. Yes. Yes. Another server, yeah, yeah, okay. Well, I, well, you can actually do that uh, in the, um, the memcached has uh, uh, those options, right? You s say start how many uh, memcached at the beginning, right? So those options, are, you need to set those options in MySQL config options. So there's a MySQL config options says uh, uh, nodb memcached underscore options. You need to have this uh, in the with the memcached options uh, in the MySQL config option. So when you start the MySQL database, it, ca it gets those uh, options and directly set to the uh, uh, memcached uh, engine we'll talk about. It pops through, then it will start multiple memcached, but it all direct to the same uh, MySQL database. So you need to uh, direct those uh, commands to actually to MySQL config option. This is one MySQL my config option to do that. Okay. So uh, any other questions so far? Is that clear how we doing this? Um, basically, we hijack one of those um, NoSQL database become a plugin of MySQL, then using some callback function and start to access InnoDB right right away. Yeah. What is the benefit of this over Um uh, what, what's the benefit of a handler socket? So, yeah, yeah. So um, I think this one, one also the, the graph we have. Um, the handler socket is a layer. Uh, okay, so you ha see the handler APIs. So there's uh, another. A uh, Japanese um, some kind of company they do a handler socket, so they directly uh, talk to the handler API in that layer. So um, the actually the action are similar, but handler socket that we uh, it's incorporated in Pocono as well. But I was talking to them uh, this morning. It's it has very messy uh, APIs. So if you want to really use handler socket, uh, the command, it's, it's not as clean as memcached. Uh, it's very messy. Uh, it's very hard to use. You have to know a lot of uh, uh, database. You have to say, well, I use this index, do this query. So it's kind of a lot of instruction um, to tell how the storage engine runs. So that's very hard to, for users to use. Um, and also, yeah. Uh, well, yes. Uh, from some uh, point, handle socket gives you the capability of a uh, more complex query, okay. like a, f a foreign key, those kind of thing. Uh, so that's one one difference. Maybe not the uh, memcached cannot do those kind of complex query. But we will think of ways to to a balance between a simpler command and also a complex query. So maybe we can extend the command for the memcached. But but that's that's difference. So from the performance standpoint, they are they are similar. Okay. So we go through this container table quickly. Uh, it tells you, you, you want to tell it uh, which database, database uh, DB scheme, DB uh, uh, table name, 
and uh, what the uh, uh, key value, key columns um, it's uh, mapping into, and what's the value, uh, value columns. Then there's flag, CIS, the expire time constraint, and unique index. Those are all required by memcached. So the most important one is saying, uh, when I do memcached operation, what's, what table it goes into? Um, that's the DB name and the DB, uh, and the DB table. So and what's the key, key column? What's the value column? So you can put the multiple value column. Uh, uh, you can put a string of uh, multiple column in this value column. It says I want to map a value to five different columns. So they can separate by a comma. Okay, so that's just repeat what I did, uh, what just I said. Also, you can tell us which index on this key column you want to actually uh, use. So flags is also for memcached. CAS is a unique number uh, identified using by the memcached. So that's also something that uh, you need to supply. Or you can, you can leave it uh, empty, but then it won't have flag uh, return. OK, the second table is called a cache policy. Uh, cache policy basically have you say, so when I have this uh, memcached engine, it has a default engine, which is uh, the, the one that used by memcached. So it's an in-memory uh, cache, everything hashed into in-memory hash table. And also, uh, we support that as well. So you can say, well, whether you want to use NLDB as a backend, or you want to use the original memcached as it is, or you want to use both. So you can use, uh, say, um, it's in, is a NLDB only, cache only or caching. So the caching is saying if I get something not in the uh, memcached cache, I can get it directly from uh, a SQL Server. Similar for the uh, write. I will write into a memcache. I will write to the, uh, um, also to the InnoDB. So that tells you which, um, which uh, storage you want to use. Well, configure option is give you the capability, say, maps di uh, different columns to the value. So because it's a key value, I can map like 10 different columns to the value, value part of the memcached. So how it operates. So one we boot in ODB, um, when you install this uh, plugin, the plugin was start to boot this uh, memcached um, as a daemon. Then it will read the config table we just talked about. So it brings those information in, and it knows which particular table it, it tried to map to. Then it will start a transaction. So there's some, some um, difference between ODB and the memcached, as we said, the memcached is non-transactional. So it doesn't have the concept of transaction. But for NODB, we must start transaction for doing anything. So we will overlay a transaction for itself. But this transaction can commit like every once in a while. Um, it doesn't need to commit every operation. So by default, they are both warm, but uh, for better performance, we usually give it a very large number. So when you do um, set, set, set with memcached, they may not um, commit every time. They may commit, um, commit in batch. So after maybe 10,000 uh, set, you commit it. Then it'll give you uh, better performance, yeah. Yes. Um, well, the question is, while you batch the transaction, can you still read uh, the value that um, be before the commit, right? Before the commit. So the the default we also have provided isolation level uh, through memcached. The default is a reader a reader dirty, so reader uncommitted. So if you're saying I want to write something to this, uh, there's a 
a connection comes in, it still can read it because it's at the default uh, transaction level is read dirty. So you write something, it's not committed, the other guy can still read it. Yeah. Uh, well, no, uh, that's something that uh, we didn't. So um, the idea, there was a suggestion that I will have a background thread running. Every once in a while, we will commit it. So you don't have like, a, you have, must have, I really want to commit it, but I have to wait until 10,000 come out. So that's kind of, uh, um, someone want to go around this. There are already some requests to go around this. So current thinking is that we have to um, have some background thread commit every once in a while, like every one second, 10 seconds. Um, we are hesitating to extend memcached command. Um, there's some approval or whatever we need to go through. Um, but that was one option we're thinking about extending, but apparently the process is longer. So it's fairly simple to actually change the add commands to memcached. Um, but um, if it's a lot of requests, then we probably can't do that. Okay, so that's the, for the transaction, batching the transaction. Okay, so that's a list of the, uh, actually the memcached commands and how it maps to InnoDB actions. So most of them, uh, get is actually read a value. Uh, so it's become a search, a select uh, from the InnoDB. So get my key, my key is the key, it returns the value whatever uh, corresponding to my key. So set, set is, uh, set is actually insert. So insert a, a, a value uh, uh, mapped to key, my key, the last number five is actually saying how long the actually the, uh, um, the, the in string will be. So it's five, uh, five character length. Uh, then you type in, type in your value, then will be stored. The 60 is a, a, a flag used uh, for whatever uh, need you want. It doesn't well defined, but you want a store like some values there, it will be there. And add, add is add a new key if it's not there. If it's not there, then we add this new key. Replace is replace existing keys. So that's mapped to an update. Append is append data to existing key. That's an update. Prepend is also same thing. Prepend, it's also update. Then they have increment and decrement. Then it goes to delete. Delete is delete the key, whatever we have. So it goes to map to delete. And it also has a command called a flush all, basically flush everything in memory. Uh, it's mapped to us to a truncate. So we truncate the table. So truncate is the only DDL it has, all other uh, DMLs. So you can have multiple tables uh, in memcached mapping, so in the containers table we just talked about, you can have a lot of um, uh, table set up. Then when you want to switch to different table, just use this at at symbol. Say I want to switch a new table, um, I want to query a new table instead of this table. So you only need to specify that once, then on uh, this connection, the mapping switch to a different table. So we also support bin log. Uh, the only thing is that um, uh, bin log is, uh, uh, is a handler. Uh, uh, its interface is in handler. So we need to call back to the handler interface to, to do that. So that's one I think we want to probably looking at improve it uh, because it's an overhead to call back to the handler interface to, to access bin log. So essentially, anything that you do in the memcached, it will be logged. So you can bring up into two different, uh, a different server. So that's uh, some detail things, uh, how we actually uh, use, uh, call back to the handler. 
uh, we need to uh, create a fake uh, thread THD instance. Then we call back, use the uh, uh, MySQL table uh, structure. So if you just look at uh, 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 how to use the standpoint, you don't need to know those details, uh, how we implement it. So we only support a role-based uh, logging. OK, so uh, there was a talk saying, uh, there's a worry saying, well, I open a door for a non-secure uh, connection to my SQL server. So um, all the SQL interface, all the SQL query, you need to have password or whatever set up. So how about we have this memcached things don't have any kind of uh, uh, security? So will that be actually messing up the um, uh, uh, database you have? So that's two, two set of um, uh, answer on that. One thing is that we have this restriction on the table you can map to. So whoever access through the memcached can only access those tables. So if a DBA says, just like we talk about containers table, they didn't put this particular table in that containers, you won't be able to access it. So that's one, one part of it. So it has limited access to memcached. The second is that we also support SSA, SASL. Uh, it's simple authentication and secure layer. So that's also building memcached as well as in uh, our uh, memcached plugin. So if you uh, have this SASL uh, uh, enabled, uh, have this library, basically it provides authentication uh, support. So it will give you some kind of uh, a security support uh, through the memcached client. So the only thing about this is that memcached client need to have this SASL support as well. There are not many uh, SAS support uh, client right now, but that's give you the option. Oh, so that's the uh, last we just give some um, performance overview. Um, that's a comparison, uh, handle socket on the right. That's done by Yoshinori. She, he's the one that um, um, talk about handle of socket. First one has uh, uh, bring up this NoSQL in memcache, uh, NoSQL with MySQL. Um, so if we just look at it, um, fairly good uh, uh, result. So if it goes to a lot of clients, you can see it's three times better than just SQL uh, in terms of reads. Writes uh, with uh, Bing log, we have some problem to solve. Um, so that's, we don't think it's any of any problem. But we are still doing performance enhancement, so we'll probably see a lot better number after we uh, down through those performance studies and enhancement. Yeah. So does the other socket get bin logging because it's coming from the handle? Yes. So they have native uh, support because the interface is in, in handle so API. So. OK, so I have one slide mentioning the uh, memcached in the uh, MySQL cluster, um, the NDB server. So if you look at it, uh, the cluster can talk uh, to the um, memcached as well, just similar to NODB. Uh, it has uh, this API building, and it, it's fairly uh, straightforward when you have, uh, because memcached was distributed. So it's kind of a very good fit with this uh, uh, MySQL cluster, because MySQL cluster is distributed as well. So it's a, it's a good thing that you can have both distributed uh, meet together, put together, and you can just starting to um, get a benefit of it. Okay, so that's a, a quick summary. Just um, summarize the uh, our effort here, um, putting a NoSQL into MySQL. So it gives you uh, just let's take a home uh, point that um, we can skip the optimizer query process. Yeah, uh, your question? Uh, 
the, the question is, does the NODB memcache do you offer expression? Uh, the short answer is no, no, no. We don't offer expression, so we uh, don't support uh, complex query. Expiration. Uh, uh, expiration, yes. Uh, expiration, yes. You can spy, uh, specify expiration time, but uh, actually we don't actually delete it. Uh, we just have a, a criteria saying, well, from the time uh, it puts in and the current time, we'll compare it. If it's uh, exceed the expiration, then then we won't return that as a, as a result. Well, uh, we are, there's a, a planning of there's a background thread. We're going to run this and all see all those uh, expired roles. We're going to delete it in the background. Uh, yeah, it will go into. It's not there yet, but it's going to be there. Yeah, future, future. Yeah, currently no, but we are going to uh, put up a, uh, yeah, yeah, the question is whether those uh, expired uh, roles will uh, get, ever get deleted. So currently in, uh, 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 implementation, don't delete them. Uh, you can do that uh, through SQL. Uh, that's the one go around currently offer to you. You just do a SQL, say delete the whoever expiration longer than this number, but we we'll actually store this in a, in a column, so you know what time they're supposed to expire. So I give you a, a, a numeric number there, says this is a second from the uh, 1971, it, it, it's going to expire. So you can delete it from the SQL layer, say delete all the rows um, that are larger than this. So, but eventually we're going to have a background strategy doing that automatically for you. Okay, um, so, um, so then uh, that's the list of the benefits we have and uh, give you persistent storage. I have a simple command. It goes give you faster access to the data. Uh, and also, the, uh, in this case, buffer pool itself uh, acts, uh, uh, behave like a, a memory uh, store. So the, uh, the InnoDB buffer pool become a memory store. If everything you can fit in the memory, it looks like it's just an in-memory database, just like a memcached. So it provides um, almost similar performance as a memcached itself. So that's my uh, presentation. So yeah, we already have. So there are some blog posts that we pro, uh, put on the uh, nodb.com. Uh, Blogs.nodb.com tells almost repeat all I, what I said here. How, tells you step by step how to use it. So it will be in 5.6. Um, currently, we have it available in lab release. So it will be released in 5.6. All right, so that's for my presentation. Any more questions? And it's, it's kind of an attempt, so you guys can give us um, any suggestion. Um, for example, um, this one um, talk about whether one more complex query to be accessible bypass the optimizer. So that's something, also JSON, right? Uh, JSON, uh, we can to support that as well. So, yeah. Uh, so, uh, I need to understand your question. You're saying that uh, you, for the transaction part, okay, so the, for the transaction part, you can some kind of signal saying commit the transaction. Uh, how, how we do that from the memcached side? Oh, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I think we can, uh, yeah, it's a good idea. We can actually do the flag. Part. Maybe we have a special number saying, well, there's a special number that tells me to, to commit it. Uh, 
Oh, okay, good. Yeah, yeah, that, that's something that yeah, just like always, how we switch table. Yes, that, that's a good, good, good point. Probably will do that, <laughs> just like you said. Um, that's, yes. So there's something that um, we need to always think uh, uh, memcached is non transactional. So it, when it talks transaction, it doesn't make sense to memcached itself. So we have to kind of compromise between the two. Um, how often you get uh, commit, and also what do you mean from the isolation level? <coughs> So if, uh, if you have a large uh, uh, batch of the transaction, sometime from a SQL standpoint, if it doesn't uh, read dirty, it read it committed, it won't see them. So people will say, well, I, I, I put something from MKHD, why I don't see it from the SQL, uh, SQL side? Because the, this batch thing. That's why we set it by default to one, even though it's not good at it uh, from a performance standpoint, because you commit things uh, uh, every insert, every set. But you can adjust it to a large number, then you be aware from the SQL part, you, you need to set the isolation level to read the, read the dirty, read the uncommitted, then you will see the data from MKHD side. So that's, uh, that's any more question? Yeah. You say Larry Ellison is, uh, I never saw him. So someone saw him in the elevator, but I never saw him. I, I can't comment it further <laughs> because <laughs> that's, uh, that's uh, I think the recording is still running, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I stopped there. Okay, thank you. Yeah. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Asterisk. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk based systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. 
At DGM, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Astros cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Astros and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community. It is global, and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Is, uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail, and CloudStack is designed to handle number one that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models. You can pick up whatever suits you better. Well, stack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack, they were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, and then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack, as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the cloud stack.